But if the Earth moves about the Sun, as Kepler had now proven, and is not the center of the universe, mankind yearned for a new form of stability. He turned from gazing at the stars to gaping at the ground itself for the security that some part of his universe was steady and unchanging. Even today, our cliches portray this common sense feeling. Keep both feet firmly on the ground. Until the early 20th century, geophysicists asserted that the oceans and continents were permanent features on the surface of the Earth. They conceded that the land rose and fell, but always in a series of uniform cycles. The Earth was a steady state machine, ever maintaining a harmonic balance between sea and land. This doctrine, known as uniformitarianism, had the ring of Plato. As long as geologists chiseled at hard rock and studied the minute features of the Earth, the impression of a solid Earth would remain imprinted in their minds. But now, what profound notion was this unique man entertaining? It may have been this rifting and shearing that led him to shatter the established view of a rigid earth, as Kepler before him. As a student of meteorology in Berlin, Alfred Wegener had devoted long hours to physical conditioning in preparation for his expeditions to Greenland. Little did he realize then that he would have to draw upon this reserve of strength to endure the rage of the scientific establishment which he would soon provoke. In 1915, he published a radical book in which he contended that the continents were drifting like pieces of a cracked ice floe. The concept of continental drift first came to me as far back as 1910, when, considering the map of the world under the direct impression produced by the coastlines on either side of the Atlantic, At first, I, I did not pay attention to the idea because I regarded it as impossible. According to associates, he had mentioned the idea much earlier. In modesty, he attributes the illumination to accident, but fortune favors the prepared mind. In the fall of 1911, I came quite accidentally upon a synoptic report in which I learned for the first time of paleontological evidence for a former land bridge between Brazil and Africa. As a result, I undertook a cursory examination of relevant research in the field of geology and paleontology, and this provided immediately such weighty corroboration that a conviction of the fundamental soundness of the idea took root in my mind. It is just as if we were to refit the torn pieces of a newspaper by matching their edges and then check whether the lines of print run smoothly across. If they do, there is nothing left but to conclude and the pieces were, in fact, joined in this way. Let us assume that we can bet 10 to 1 of the correctness of drift theory just on the first line alone. The folding of the Sierras of Buenos Aires and the Cape Mountains. Then, since there are at least six independent tests available, we can bet a million to 1 on the theory being right. About 200 million years ago, he concludes, a supercontinent, Pangaea, began to break up and continental pieces drifted to their present positions. We may assume one thing as certain. The forces which displace continents are the same as those which produce great fold mountain ranges. 
continental drifts, faults, earthquakes, volcanoes, polar wanderings are undoubtedly connected causally on a grand scale. However, what is cause and what effect, only the future will unveil. A year after the 1922 edition of his book is published, the Royal Geographical Society meet to consider Wegener's hypothesis. The high priests of science convene to suppress heresy. In examining ideas so novel as those of Wegener, a moving continent is as strange to us as a moving earth was to our ancestors, and we may be as prejudiced as they were. It is not easy to avoid bias. Whatever his own attitude may have been originally, in his book he is not seeking the truth. Wagner has come forward with a theory which deals with the distribution of the continents in a bold way and offers himself for sacrifice. He is certainly getting it. Three years later, the American Association of Petroleum so seen fit to leave a symposium on the drift theory, at which Wegener himself is present. If we are to believe Wagner's hypothesis, we must forget everything which has been learned in the last 70 years and start all over again. My principal objection to Wagner's hypothesis rests on the author's method. This, in my opinion, is not scientific, but is a selective search through the literature for corroborative evidence, ending in a state of auto-intoxication. We are on safe ground only so long as we follow the teachings of the law of uniformity. The battle over the theory of the permanency of the Earth's greater features has been fought and won by Americans long ago. Fifteen years later, a battle erupted which was the field of admirals and generals, not geologists and geophysicists. Engaging in anti-submarine and mine-sweeping operations, British and American scientists felt a tedium after their initial success in deploying their weapons of destruction. After the Battle of the Atlantic, scientists turned to modifying the electronics of war into instruments of research. Others acquired another skill. Before the war, science was considered a hobby by those outside the profession. Because of their contribution to the war effort, scientists acquired a new prestige. They learned how to lobby for money with an intensity to match their newly acquired esteem. Only when scientists turned their backs on the comforts of libraries and boarded ships with advanced funding and tools would the oceans unlock the secret of the continents.